in case you ask me to suggest the first reading for this course which should be mandatory for everybody in theory then i will suggest the concluding article in dn madan's india the religions perspectives from sociology and history 2004 he has titled it religion in india an essay in interpretation and uh, in the introduction he has written india's religions morality and pluralism these two essays give you an overview of sociology of religion in india although he had over simplified a very complicated picture nonetheless he has done a good work of introducing you different interpretations of india's religions and interestingly he had given two quotes in the conclusion and some other quotes in the introduction let us come to conclusion first page number 3 84 first quotation is from the rig veda the oldest available book of this planet ekam sad vipra bahudha vadan and then he has given the translation the truth is but one comma do learner do the learned state it in different ways he is a great scholar because he doesn't know sanskrit but he can quote it uh, and he is also a great translator because he has translated the way he has and neither a scholar uh, nor a translator uh, but i know a couple of languages since sight uh, therefore as far as i remember it is एकम सद विप्रा बहुधा वदंती एंड द ट्रांसलेशन विल बी दैट द नवमेना इज वन बट द बींग्स अप्रोच इज डिफरेंट नाउ यू सी हाउ लैंग्वेज इज प्ले ट्रिक then he has given another quote which is again a translation it is from mahatma gandhi uh, 30th may 1913 uh, madan had quoted personally comma 
I think the world as a whole will never have comma and need not have comma a single religion. And then in the you know uh, first page of the book, he had given four quotations. Two is from Jawaharlal Nehru, which I will not read. Third is from D.P. Mukherjee, who was his teacher. When the Indian progressive youth, it is from D.P. Mukherjee, when the Indian progressive youth dismisses religion and opium, comma, he is not only ignoring social facts, comma, but in bracket also the historical process itself by which did have assumed the attached values. This is from Modern Indian Culture by Dhurjati Prasad Mukherjee, T.N. Badan's teacher and the most respected Marxist Indian sociologist of the world. I said the most respected Marxist sociologist of the world. Because Marx is not only a sociologist, he is also economist, political philosopher and a scientist of nature. Excluding Marx, Almost every Marxist scholar of the world regards him as a pillar. Then, uh, this is from 1948, Modern Indian Culture. And then the last uh, quotation is from Charles Taylor. Varieties of Religion Today, 2003. A thoroughly post durkhemian society would be one in which our religious belonging would be unconnected to our national identity. Full stop. It will almost certainly be one in which the gamut of such religious allegiances will be wide and varied. Now I will repeat uh, the D.P. Mukherjee quotation. When the Indian progressive youth dismisses religion and opium, comma, he is not only ignoring social facts, again, comma, but in bracket also the historical process itself by which they have assumed the attached values. 1948. Now, why I am referring to the four quotations from this book? Because it sums up the entire book. And now I wanted to share with you the source of these four quotations. But first, let us concentrate on the contradictions. Now, D.P. Mukherjee, the doyen of Marxist thought, had given a view of religion which is not widely known in India. Second, Sir Charles Taylor is the author of The Secular Age, the most celebrated secular treatise on the religion, where he claimed that religion is a false consciousness and he was not a Marxist, he was a liberal. <coughs> Therefore, what I am trying to say is that within the same school of sociology anywhere in the world, you will find shifting formulations 
of any concept including religion. Therefore, please forget the old habit of regarding any concept as solid. Number one. And number two, the polarity between materialistic and spiritual is naive, childlike, if not childish. Because I have shown you the book, The Positive Background of Hindu Sociology Study. And although it is a fat book, but it is a summary, it is a breeze version. The book was written in four volumes, like August Kunte's book on positive philosophy. And there are uh, five points, and uh, I'll begin with D. Uh, he said in the positive background of Hindu sociology, he was a devout Hindu. Devout Hindu. He used to spend four to five hours in the morning in worshipping Goddess Kali. And what he had written, listen. And this he wrote in 1906 when Swadeshi movement was going on in Bengal. This is, this is not me, this is B.K. Sarkar. And I quote verbatim, I, I, I do not exclude even commas and full stops. Therefore, I am quoting from him. Aggressive materialism. Please first listen and then write. What a devout Hindu from Bengal has written during the height of Swadeshi movement. Aggressive materialism and not a spiritualism or asceticism constituted the dominant core of Hindu society. Therefore, I told you, you have every right to support or criticize only when you read the book or you interact with the teacher in person. Otherwise, there is no difference between you and the politicians who are winning our beautiful planet. B.K. Sarkar said, aggressive materialism and not a spiritualism or asceticism constituted the dominant core of Hindu society. This is his original quote. And then he writes, Weber is wrong and ignorant that Asian religions, including Hinduism, are otherworldly and irrational in nature. Now I am sharing with you how he came to this conclusion. Was it the personal opinion of B.K. Sarkar or he had studied it? Even the worst critique of B.K. Sarkar will say he was a very meticulous scholar. Therefore, what are the foundations of B.K. Sarkar's positive background of Hindu sociology? Now, in the abridged version which I had, it is around 2000 pages, you know, and he had four four volumes of it. Therefore, it is a very bulky book. Uh, in the first part, in the very introduction, he says, Sukra Niti, not Chanakya Niti. Sukracharya as ethical prophet of Hindu India. His, his sociology it is neither based on the Vedas nor based on Manuskriti, unlike Max Weber, Marshall Moss and many others. He says, to understand classical Hindu society and not Hindu religion, to understand classical Hindu society, the first textbook should be Sukraniti. 
and Lord Chanakya Niti, which, which was very popular among British Indologists like Sir William Jones and Max Muller. Now, Max Muller was born as a German, but he is regarded as father of British Indology. You know why? Because East India Company had commissioned him to edit the sacred books of the East. And what was the criteria? He was the lowest bider. Then in Germany, there were about 25 great scholars of Sanskrit and Vedas, but they quoted higher price. And who are uh, Mr. Max Fuller? Just a fresh graduate of Sanskrit. And what was East India Company? It was not university. It was a company, you see, profit-making company. Therefore, they hired the person who charged the least. Therefore, you can imagine in case you are suffering from brain cancer and a non-expert is hired to operate you. Therefore, Max Muller's English translation of the Vedas should not be considered seriously. But he not only edited and translated the Vedas, but the sacred books of the East. Therefore, the whole sociology of Max Weber is dependent on Max Muller's translation of the sacred books of the East. Therefore, his interpretation of Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, Persian Islam, Arabic Islam, Chinese uh, religion, and Japanese religion is hopelessly dependent on sacred books of the East. Therefore, it is not only that Max Weber suffers from methodological lacuna, methodological uh, deficiency, that he reads the religious text of other people directly, whereas he reads Protestant ethic indirectly through the help of Benjamin Franklin. He requires an expert to understand his mother's language. But he doesn't require expert for a reading foreign religions and foreign thought. Neither language is mastered nor the lexicon of the theologians is taken care of. Therefore, what is sociology of religion in the whole global village? An elephant, as the Jainad say, and seven blind men. There is a story among the Jains of India that reality is like an elephant, and the scholars are like seven blind men, and whatever they catch hold of, because they cannot see the whole, they think that. The elephant is like the ear, the elephant is like the leg, the elephant is like the trunk. Therefore, I will suggest that even though it is not possible in one and a half months to read the sacred text of any religion in India, you should be aware that in case the very source of your interpretation is wrong, unreliable, your sophisticated scholarship is of no use. 
are you getting the point and in sociology of uh, religion in india to the best of my knowledge only two people have tried sincerely to take basic text into account and there is a third who is the most influential sociologist of india gs bhutia i'll come to gs bhutia a little later first i am referring to two great star wars one is of course b k sarkar and second is a k saran but what is the difference the difference is that b k sarkar did single handedly whereas a k saran worked in a team you know intercontinental team now uh, who are the team members of ak saran he collaborated with anand kanti kumar swami and his son rama p kumar swami of boston united states of america although he was born in sri lanka ceylon and his father was uh, a tamil hindu from jaffna and mother was a you know catholic lady from london just after his birth he was born in mool nakshatra you know uh, mool nakshatra is a constellation in which at the time of birth moon is situated and it is believed that the people born in uh, this nakshatra there are four other nakshatras uh, lose their father very early in life sometimes also uh, other guardians including mother therefore just after the death of the father the mother took him to london and he was uh, trained in geology then he came to you know his father's land uh, sri lanka he was a geologist and uh, when he was mapping the you know uh, landscape of sri lanka he came he came across uh, certain objects which was disputed in geological society whether it will be classified as craft or art or religious object he was neither a sociologist nor a theologian nor a philosopher therefore he has started asking the local people what is it and he got multiple answers then it was said the answer can be provided only in india but uh, it was not possible for him to come to india because he was a student of theology and he was on field work he went to london and then came again then swadeshi movement was going on in india he came to calcutta swadeshi movement was going on and he became the guest of tagore family then 
Rabindranath Tagore was not a very hot figure in intellectual circle. The two towering personalities of that time were Sir Asutosh Mukherjee, who was the Vice Chancellor of Calcutta University, then BK Sarkar. Therefore, BK Sarkar, Rabindranath Tagore, and Kumar Swami interacted with another person, his name was DNC. Now, uh, Rabindranath Tagore has written on religion of man. There is a book by Rabindranath Tagore. Primarily it was written in Bengali, but we have English translation today. According to me, it is a popular book, not a scholarly book. But D.M. Seale's book, The Positive Sciences of the Hindus, is a terribly important book. And it should be read with the positive background of Hindu sociology, the poor one. Of course, you cannot read during the semester. But you must know what was written in the two books. And the second, and here comes the second book. First book is Sukraniti. It is easily available in the market. In case you are interested, you can read it. But maybe here the library doesn't have a very authentic translation. The second book which they read was the Rig Veda, not the Four Vedas. And what struck their mind was that the Vedas say there are four Vedas the Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sam Veda, Atharva Veda. These are four standard Vedas. And there is a fifth Veda. What is that? That is called Bharat Munid Nati Shastra. Now they started reading the first Veda, Rig Veda. And they were utterly surprised. Because the first sentence in the Veda is that it is not a religious. Vedas define themselves that there are two types of knowledge in the world. One is called Paravidya, the science of salvation, science of liberation, the Paravidya. And second is the Aparavidya, the science of creation. And the Vedas say that we, all four of us, all four Vedas, do not belong to the religion of salvation. You know, the science of salvation, rather. We belong to Aparavidya. Vedas have nothing to do at all with religion. It had some examples which may be useful or not useful for religion. The way we understand it in sociology, primarily Vedas belong to Aparavidya, the science of creation. Now, by then, when Kumar Swami, BK Sarkar, and BM Seal were discussing this, Calcutta already had a world-class educational institution called the Asiatic Society of Bengal. It was founded by a person called Sir William Jones in 1789. And we are discussing 1914, around 1914, although sociology was started in Calcutta University in 1906-7. But when Kumar Swami came, it was already 1914-something. Now, then, once they read it directly in the Vedas, that the Vedas classify, we are not a religious text at all. 
Then they started reading Sir William, Stone, Sir William Jones. And William Jones had also written that Vedas have nothing to do with religion. Vedas are Hindu sciences. Number one. But second, he said Hindu is not a religious concept or national concept. It is a geocultural concept. Therefore, everybody who lived in India was called Hindu then. Words keep change, you know, you know, the words are not static, their connotations change with time. For example, in 19th century, people thought that human body is solid, isn't it? But today we know that 75% of our body is liquid. Liquid means blood. Liquid means cuff. Cuff is phlegm. Liquid also means undigested water. And a liquid also means urine. And liquid also means plasma. Therefore, our human body is not solid. It is 75% liquid. And then there is also air. Every air which we breathe in is not built out. Are you getting the point? Most people, you know, erroneously think that you breathe in and out. No. Even on biology, Newton's law applies. And what is the second, th your second law of Newton? That is called second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics says that although Energy cannot be destroyed. The sum total of energy will be the same. And air is also energy. Therefore, the energy in the form of, you know, uh, oxygen, which we breathe in, is transformed a structural transformation of levi stars into carbon. Oxygen is transformed into carbon. And then we breathe out carbon. But not all the carbons are, you know, ejected. And this is the cause of our illness. What happens? In the process of transformation from Oxygen to carbon, the law of second law, the second law of thermodynamics applies, and the oxygen goes in entropy. What is entropy? Entropy is like you know a functional equivalent of black hole in our body, and that disturbs the equilibrium between what cuff and pith. The seven humors which constitute our body. Therefore, our body is 75% liquid, almost 10% air, and the rest is solid. Now, unless and until you take into account the solid, liquid and gaseous in your body, you cannot understand society. Because what is matter according to you? Matter is always solid. Because unconsciously or subconsciously consciously you think that matter is element, which can be observed if not by your naked eyes, then by the microscope. Isn't it? But modern biology, contemporary biology says that the molecules are wave. 
ones who break the atom. You have neutron, proton and electron and these are uh, once you break them uh, to the next level we have wave. The, these things are discussed in the book Tau of Physics by Fritz of Capra which I was referring in the first initial classes. Therefore, B. N. Seal wrote the positive sciences of the Hindus and within that he has dealt with Vedic mathematics, physics, Vedic chemistry, Vedic biology. And B. K. Sarkar has dealt with Vedic aesthetics, Vedic literature, Vedic ethics. There is no doctrine in the Vedas. There is no prophetic doctrine in the Vedas. We have discussed the place of doctrine in understanding of religion, isn't it? When we were discussing church, sect and cult. Therefore, they say, it is not a miracle that Indians are tolerant. It is not a special gift of Indians that they are tolerant. Then what it is? They say, from the very beginning, there has been plurality in India. There have been different belief systems, different practices, different mode of thought, even in the Vedas. Vedas are not coherent to hold like the Bible or the Quran or the Dhammapada of the Buddhists or the Jain Davesta of the Parsis. Are you getting the point? Vedas are, Vedas are book of sciences. Once it was declared, the fight began. The, the Europeans said, no, 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 no. Vedas are not your books. Vedas were not composed in India. It was not written in India at all. It was written in a joint homeland of Europeans and Hindus. Hindus means Indians. Because Hindu is a Persian term for inhabitants near the bank of Sindhu River. Like, you know, in inhabitants on the bank of river Nile are called Egyptians. In the same way, Hindu means Indians living on the bank of river Sindhu, Indus. And they did not have one religion, you know. In the Vedas, at least there are two schools. There are multiple schools, but you can classify those schools into two broader categories. One, which belonged to the lineage of sages called Bhriguj, and the other Angiraj. Now, Sukracharya, who wrote the Sukraniti and, who is, uh, and which is the foundation of B.K. Sarkar, Sukrachar was a disciple of Bhrigurishi and he was guru of the you know mythological demon called Ramana. Ramana was not only a king, he was also a great acharya, great scholar and there is a book which is available even today. I have a copy in case you are interested I can show you. It is called Ravan Sanghita. It is the most revered existing book of astrology which is consulted all over the world. Therefore, first step one, Dhrigu, second, Sukrachar, third, Vishwamitra, the king, fourth, Raman who wrote Ravan Sanghita, fifth Brihaspati, who gave, who gave us the philosophy of Lokayata, that is also known as Charvaka Darshan. 
जावत जीवेत सुखम जीवेत ऋणम कृत्वा ऋतम पीवेत Our Indian Marxists are very fond of this sentence, but they do not know who wrote this. Charvak was Sita Ram Yajuri of Lokayat Darshan. He was not Karl Marx. The Karl Marx of Lokayat philosophy was a great devout Hindu sage called Brihaspati, who is regarded as Dev Guru. the raj guru of lord indra who is writing lokayat philosophy the materialistic philosophy of hindu the priest the teacher the preceptor of lord indra but since ignorance is bliss in india anybody can say anything whether it is vivekananda or whether it is uh, dayanand or whether it is narendra modi or whether it is sitaram yajuri this is the age of fools therefore people like me are neither humans nor animals they do not read before you support or oppose you must know what is written in the book then you know hindus have uh, nine major upanishads the most celebrated upanishad is called yagyavalli you know brihadaranya upanishad this is a fact book 3000 page fact book and said yagyavalli who is the most relevant person to understand your contemporary hindu society because hindu personal law you think that only muslims have personal law You 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 are both Sariyat, but why not you are both your Mitakshara and Dayabhag? Why you do not give equal property to your daughters? Because you Hindu follow two personal laws of yours. What one is called Mitakshara, and second is called Dayabhag. Mitakshara and Dayabhag are both part of Yagyavalli Kaspriti. and yagyavalli smriti is relevant even today therefore point b b k sardar sukra niti not chanakya niti because who is chanakya he is after the buddha contemporary of alexander the, the great or whatever and who is sukrachar he is a vedic sage Because the Sarkar is saying, you cannot understand 20th century Hindu society without making a direct reference to the Vedas. And then he is saying, on the basis of Vedic literature, we realize that aggressive materialism and not a spiritualism or asceticism constituted the dominant core of hindu society now the question was asked by a person called ram krishna paramhans who had no more available in the body please listen carefully please listen carefully a question was asked by a person called ram krishna paramhans who are no more available in human body than he was declared dead long you have every right to laugh at me but then in delhi there is a there there is a, there is a building called kumayu tomb and you read the persian literature what is written in babar nama kumayu was very ill and the vaidya you know the yunani vaidya the ayurvedic vaidya declared he cannot live beyond 24 hours and then babar who was not 
born here. He was born in uh, part of uh, area which is called Tajikistan, I suppose. You know, he he went in meditation. He prayed to the Allah and said, "O oh God." In case you think I have been your pious devotee, then give my life to my And the witnesses were there and they have written the account, it is available in Persian. And then he fainted, Baba fainted and Humayu started recovering. Then you read Akbar Nam. You know, him who was winning over Bairam Khan, who was fighting on behalf of Akbar. And then suddenly, Bairam Khan prayed. Bairam Khan prayed. And there was some sort of miracle. There is a place in Delhi called Hajarat Vidamuddin. There is a place in Agra called Sikri, near Fatehpur Sikri. And there is a place in Ajmer Sarif called Ajmer Sarif Darga. These are, these, are, these are so called Muslim places, but these are not Muslim places. These are Sufi sense Darga. And you go to any Darga, Hindus will outnumber the Muslims. In the same way, you go to Kasi Vishwanath temple in Varanasi and you will find local Muslims coming to that place. It is not tolerance. It is a question of language. For an Indian, it is very difficult to master the type of, you know, technical Latin which they use in the Roman Catholic Church. It is very difficult for an Indian Muslim to master the type of Arabic which, which was used by Prophet himself. Because today your English training or European training it distorting your traditional pronunciation. And today some of you must be having your iPhones and you know there are verbal passwords in case it doesn't match with the mechanical force it will not open your phone will not open in the same way people are so ignorant about Hindu faith. It is said that there are 33 crores Hindu gods and goddesses in India. Wrong. They are not gods and goddesses. They are passwords. Totemic passwords. There is a great science behind every religion. But the intolerant faith called modernity is not comfortable with any other. In all the traditions you will find tolerance. Just 30 years ago in Kashmir there was so much tolerance. You know that Ladakh is primarily Buddhist and Jammu is primarily Hindu and you know the, the valley is primarily Muslims. Do you know? Up to 18th century, there was no communal riot in India. And this is not my data, this is British data. The first communal riot in India took place in 18th century. Communal riot and fundamentalism is a modern phenomenon. 
What you find in tradition is deviance. And what you find in tradition is individual deviance. Take for example Ramayana of Valmiki or Tulsidas. One family of demon, Raman family. Is there no difference between Kumbhaka and Vibhishan and Raman? Is there no difference between Ram, Lakshman, Bharat and Satrugun? There is no difference, is there no difference between Sita and Urmila? Is there no difference between Sumitra, Kaikai and, uh, and Kosalya? Is there no difference between Ganga, Satyavati, Draupadi and Madri? What you are doing, my dear friends? You are oversimplifying, you are reifying. You do not understand what the prophet meant when he allowed four, four, you know, uh, spouses. He never, you know, you, you, you do not uh, try to understand and some people foolishly try to rationalize it. He only meant this, that, and he said in all the religions. How many wives Lord Dasarat had? Three. How many wives Lord Krishna had? 125. Is four more than uh, 125? Therefore, don't, don't paint any religion in black or white. Try to understand it most humbly. It is a very sophisticated discourse. It is a very sophisticated discourse. And two persons, B.K. Sarkar single-handedly and A.K. Saran tried to do this. The partners of A.K. Saran were Rene Gueno from France, Anand Kentish Kumar Swami from United States of America, Sayyad Hussain Nasr from Iran, and uh, Samdang Rin Poche from Tibet, and Marco Palis from England. You know, they said that you cannot understand all the religions on your own. You need a specialized knowledge. And on the solid foundation of these people, which is known as perennial, perennial philosophy, that a good sociology of religion can be made. The third person who tried to read the basic text was G.S. 